rainy Friday. So it appears that Mantis is still misbehaving. Folks are still having problems connected to it, uh, connecting to it. So uh, it may be that connecting from a CS lab computer will work, um, but there's some problem with personal computers. Uh, there's also another CS server called Mirage, but uh, unlike Mantis, you weren't all like given accounts on Mirage, but I can make that happen today so that that will be another option uh, to connect to. Um, but please keep letting me know as you have problems connecting because I want to keep working on figuring out how to get this uh, operating the, the way we expect. So I will, I will send out an, an announcement on, on Moodle later today after I've had a, a chance to follow up with Mike Ty. The birds for today are our last uh, set of birds from Australia, at least for now. Uh, we have the masked lapwing um, in, a, in a very bright disguise. Uh, we have the laughing kookaburra, and we also have the Australian bustard standing about three feet tall, uh, puffing itself up to, to look very uh, regal and important. So, what questions uh, do you have about uh, the lab, things we, we've talked about in class? Almost certainly to attract a mate whenever a, a, a bird uh, puffs itself up. That's almost always the reason. <laughs> All right, let's do a warm up to kind of get back into where we left off on Wednesday. All right, let's just get, uh, get back into thinking about uh, representing numbers in bits. So if we have n bits for an unsigned integer, what is the range of different unsigned integers that we can make with n bits? So definitely not zero to n, but maybe one of these other three involving a power of two. Please discuss with your neighbors uh, why you think it's it's the one you chose. All right, so it is the last one here. The majority has it uh, has it right. Uh, why? Uh, where do we get this? 2 to the n minus 1. Where does that come from? Yes. I mean, the total number of numbers you can represent with a series of bits is just going to be 2 to the power of n when n is the number of bits. But then since we're representing 0 with 0, 0, 0, etc., we have to be minus 1 for the top end of the range. Exactly right. But uh, each bit has two possibilities. So if we have n bits, that's 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 for the number of different things. Uh, and yes, if we have 0, then that sort of prevents us from, from getting all the way to, to, to 2 to the end. Any questions about this? All right. So we had this circle of three bit unsigned integers. They went from zero to seven. And then we just kept adding one to each, we move to the next. And briefly mentioned at the end of Wednesday that we have uh, this idea of overflow, 
where if we had 1, 1, 1 plus 1, this would give us 1 with three zeros, but we have a fixed width number, meaning we only have three bits. And so when we have something carry out past the three bits, we throw it away, and we end up with wrapping back around to zero from seven. So then the question is, okay, unsigned numbers seem uh, maybe straightforward. We can just add the, the binary together, do arithmetic just like we might expect. But how would we do signed numbers? So we're going to consider two different strategies for representing signed integers. So why not to get started? Uh, I'd like you to, to brainstorm with your neighbors for a couple minutes uh, ways that we might approach or, or ideas you might have about representing positive and negative numbers using some pattern of bits. All right. So, what's, uh, can someone share an idea that came up in, in your discussion? Yes. One of, oh, mm -hmm. one of the bits can be like in, in the final positive or negative, like zero, positive, one, and. Yeah, so we could reserve one of our bits to indicate positive or negative, and then the rest of the bits are the number. This system has a name. Sign and magnitude. And one bit for the sign and the other bits as the magnitude. So we again have our circle of three bit values. We have zero, one, two. Three, what would this be? Negative zero. Negative zero. Okay, that's a little weird. Uh, negative one. Negative one. Negative two. And negative three. Negative two and negative three. So, what are some what are some observations about this this system? Yes. It, yeah, sorry. It's horribly inefficient. You're losing the eighth of your number so much. <laughs> Yeah, we, I mean, it's, it's wood, per, proportionally with three bits, it's, it's bad. But we do have, we do have two zeros. Uh, two zeros is, is weird. Do we say that these are, are equal? Are they not equal? Um, yeah, so there's, there's some weirdness in this, in this two zeros thing. Other, other observations? Yeah. Yeah, when we, like, add a positive and a negative number, we can't just add the bits together and see what we get. Like if we add uh, negative two plus one, what do we end up with? Yeah, negative two plus one is negative three if we just add the bits together. So we're gonna have to like do do something more complicated to, to do arithmetic with this system. Yeah. Um, if we have digits from first digit all the way up to n digits, then that n digit is going to be equal to um, negative 2 to the n. It is in, in this system? Or? Uh, oh, I'm saying like a new system. Oh, so, so maybe we have some other system where, again, our most significant bit is special. And uh, we'll get to that, that in a moment. That also has a name. Uh, other observations about sine of magnitude. So one nice thing about sine sine of magnitude is that our positive numbers are the same as our unsigned numbers. So that means at least for doing 
stuff with positive numbers, kind of sine magnitude and unsigned and unsigned might be similar. So that, that's a nice feature. We, we would like to maybe keep that if we were to, to use another system. And the other thing that I'll observe is that the negative numbers here have a property where if we add one to them, they get more negative. And that's not ideal. We'd like it so if we increment, um, if we add one to a negative number, it gets closer to zero rather than farther away. And so we'll be able to kind of fix a lot of problems with this sign and magnitude. using a system called two's complement. And this is what uh, uh, Christian described, where we're going to say our most significant bit will count for its negative weight. So on Wednesday, we talked about bit weight, where just like the, the, the two to whatever power, the place that the bit is in. So under two's complement, we're going to say most significant bit is its negative weight, and the rest are normal. So if we put this uh, in our uh, little wheel, fill in again. We keep, because it's only the most significant bit that is negative, we keep this property where our positive numbers are the same as the unsigned ones. So we have 0, 1, 2, 3. And what would this be under this most significant bit counts as negative, the rest are positive? Yeah, it would be negative 4, as we have the, the 1's place, the 2's place, and the 4's place. And our most significant bit here is, is negative. So we'd have negative 4. And then what would the next one be? Yeah, negative 3. We have a negative 4 and a positive 1. That gives us a total of negative 3. This next one, we have negative 4 and then positive 2. Negative 4, positive 3. So what, what of the, the issues that we identified with sign and magnitude, uh, which of those have we perhaps fixed with this 2's complement representation? Yeah? Uh, you don't have a negative 0 now, so they are going back to yeah, we've, we've gotten rid of this negative zero weirdness uh, because we're not reserving a bit that is doing something separate than the kind of the, uh, than the value of the number, it's just the sign. Although we still have a bit that tells us the sign, it just also now affects the, the magnitude of the number as well. Yeah? If you add a positive magnitude number, it should be if we add numbers under this system, it turns out it just works. So if we again do negative 2 plus 1, our negative 2 look like this. Our 1, 0, 0, 1. This gives us 1, 1, 1, which wouldn't you know it is negative 1. And so under 2's complement, we can just add the bits together use exactly the same arithmetic operation that we would with unsigned, and we will get the correct result. That's kind of magical that under this system we can actually do signed and unsigned arithmetic using exactly the same hardware. The circuits don't need, don't need to change at all. Other observations about Differences between two's complement, sine and magnitude.
We have thrown away our, our negative zero, and we have an additional, like, actual number that we care about to represent. And we have one more negative number than we do positive numbers, because we still have zero. And so we have zero, and then positive numbers, uh, uh, and then and then negative numbers. So. If we were to say two's complement with three bits, what is the, the range of numbers that we can represent? Yeah, negative four, two, three. And how might I write these as powers of two? Yep, we have negative two squared to two squared minus one. And so if we then say, well, let's not with three bits, but with n bits, we had 3 bits gave us 2 squared to 2 squared minus 1. These exponents become n minus 1. And so a 2's complement of n bits gives us this range from negative 2 to the n minus 1 up to 2 to the n minus 1. And just like with unsigned, we have this minus 1 because 0 takes up one of our, our spots. What are your questions about this? Yes? Is there a, like a relative disadvantage of the, uh, like the negative weight system as opposed to the sign of the system? So, I would say that the sign and magnitude system is more intuitive. Like it is the first thing that I would think of for how to, how to represent these numbers. And it's easy to, to look at the bit pattern and figure out what, what the value is. But apart from that sort of easier to, to think about perhaps, I don't see any reason to prefer a sign and magnitude to two's complement. Kind of all the, on all the, the, the technical aspects of how many numbers can we represent, how easy is it to do arithmetic, do negative numbers um, kind of increment the way we want, we add one to a negative number and it gets closer to zero. On all of those aspects, two's complement does, does what we would prefer compared to sign and magnitude. So I am not aware of any system that uses a sign of magnitude to represent uh, uh, integers. Uh, two's complement is kind of pretty universal in how computers actually, actually, what they actually do. Other questions? So looking at this circle, I hope that it has become clear how that example of 200 times 300 times 400 times 500 gave us a large negative number. Because as we go around the circle and get to our biggest positive number and go past it, one past our biggest positive is our biggest negative number. And so when we overflow from positive into negative, we end up with a, a huge negative number. When we overflow from negative into positive, again, we're at large positive numbers. And this is, compared to sign of magnitude, we've kind of flipped the, the way that the negative numbers go. So they're, uh, and it has this nice effect that zero and negative one are now next to each other. Negative one, zero, one, that's great. But it means that when we're thinking about the overflow, it's kind of max positive into max negative.
All right. Let's do some practice with our new twos complement knowledge. So first up, let's take the four bit number one zero one one. And under any of these, we have three different representations here. And I would like you to determine which of those four answers does not match any of these three. So we take these four bits, we can kind of figure out what they are. Unsigned, by a magnitude, two's complement, uh, and one of those answers is going to be the odd one out. <laughs> no, it seems seems like that does not does not affect it. Fortunately, that would be that would be a, a, a problem. Um, all right, we're mostly thinking negative four. And got a quick discussion with your neighbors about how you apply each of these three systems uh, to those bits. All right, in this in this case, uh, the majority is correct. Uh, we can't get negative four out of this pattern of bits uh, under any of these three three systems. Uh, any questions on on how that how that works? All right. So now let's move into eight bits. Getting more, more and more bits. And now let's just practice some twos complements. So which two uh, base 10 values do these 8-bit numbers represent using twos complement? So most of us thinking negative 1 and, and 39, maybe some, some other possibilities. Uh, again, discuss with your, your neighbors how you Use to to complement on these. Exactly. The, the the binary that's all ones may seem like it should be a big number, but in fact, you might think that for the first seven places, if we had those all ones and we added one to that, we'd get a one in the eighth place with all zeros. So those first seven all ones is like one away from one and seven zeros. And so our most significant bit being negative, that's one away from all of our positive seven bits together. And that's, uh, as was pointed out, true for, for no matter how many bits our two's complement has. All ones is going to be going to be negative one. Uh, how about our, our second number here? Yeah. 32 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1 is 39. Exactly. We can look at what, trying to figure out, uh, okay, 2 to the 0, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th. We have a 1 and 2 to the 5th for 32, and then add the rest, and we get, we get 39. Questions on this? And last bit of uh, practice with our, our cards. Uh, we have four 8-bit numbers. Uh, which of them have the same signed value? So again, under two's complement as the four-bit number 1100. So we have four different 8-bit numbers. We can figure out what the two's complement value of each of those is. And I'm asking which of those are equivalent to the value we get from a four bit two's complement number 1100. So all those are, the space is just. Well, the space is just to make it easier to, to see like which bits are, are, are where. All right, we're, we're mostly thinking it's, it's C. Uh, have a discussion with your, your neighbors why, uh, why uh, you chose the answer you did.
So I know one. If what is the what is the value of, of this four bit number under a two sum? Negative four. How do we get that? Negative eight plus four. Yeah, our most negative bit is in the eights place. Negative eight plus four gives us negative four. So we want some number that, that is going to be negative four under twos, twos complement of eight bits. So if we have, we know that the most significant bit has to be one, because that's the only way we can get a negative number in two's complement. So step, it, it can't be that, that first, that the answer A. What is the weight of uh, this most significant bit? Oh, well. <laughs> two to negative two to the power seven. So that's negative two to the seventh, and then negative 128. So now maybe by process of elimination, we can say, well, we, we probably have to add a, no, a significant number of positive bits to get negative 28 down to, to negative four. Uh, so Without actually working out, out the math, I would guess that it would need to be C, that we would need a lot of, a lot of ones to, to get this to balance out. Uh, if we uh, do the math of uh, 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 4, we need to find out that that, that will give us negative 4. So it will be C. This illustrates. Uh, something called sign extension. That if we want to Just take the sign, whether it's zero or one, whatever the most significant bit is, and just copy that out. And that will actually give us the equivalent value just using more bits. So that's how we know going from this four bits to eight bits, we take our sign bit, which is also contributing to the value, which is my uh, two's complement. And then we just copy it out to the new bits that we're adding. And then we use the same bits as before here. So we take these and go here and take our sign and copy it out. And this is called sign extension. What are your questions? Yes. Is there a sign contraction? So there is something called truncation, which is uh, you just throw away the bits that don't fit anymore. So this, this is why you have to be very careful about converting between different types of images. Because if we have, say, a, a, a char, a one byte integer, what is the maximum positive value that we can make with eight bits? 255. 255 would be yeah, all seven of these. So I think 255 would give us the, uh, the maximum unsigned integer. But if this is an 8-bit signed integer, 
we won't actually be able to, so if it's unsigned, we get zero to, to 255. If it's signed, it's 127 is the most that we can make. It'd be negative 128. And so if we are converting some integer that uses more bits to a char, and it's bigger than 127 or smaller than negative 128, we just, we can't fit our, the integer we have into a char. And so we just lock off the bits that don't fit. It's called truncation, and we're gonna lose some information. There's just no way to avoid that. Yes? Do you lock them off from the least significant end or the most significant end? From the most significant end. Yes? Uh, you, if we had 32 bits, we take the upper 24 and throw them away. So, like, you could map like negative 129 to 127. Yes. Yeah. Going to a smaller size, dangerous. And this is, in fact, the thing that caused that that European rocket to explode. There was a, 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 a cast uh, from 64-bit to a 16-bit quantity. Uh, it overflowed, bad, badness ensued. Other questions? Yes? Um, so you said that 200 times 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 so that's a good question. If we if we were doing this 200 times 200 times 400 times 500, the code that I used for this did it. The the result was going to be stored in an int. So which, even though I did it in Java, an int is also four bytes in Java, just like it is in C. And the product of those four numbers is a larger positive number then we can represent with 32 bits. So this is sort of a, a programming language uh, design question. Like when this happens, when we do arithmetic that overflows, that we just cannot represent the result in memory we're restoring it, do we raise an error or throw an exception? Or do we just let the program kind of file on through? Job and C say, file on through, not a problem. <laughs> Overflow is fine. This is, this is what this is, uh, uh, what was intended. Other languages, I think Python raised an exception for an overflow error. So the only way to actually represent the correct answer is to use more memory, to use more than the four bytes. So, In a language where there was such a, uh, with the did raise an exception, you could catch that and then try and uh, uh, store the result using using more memory. But in C and Java, uh, you kind of have to anticipate that this might happen ahead of time. There's no way in in runtime to uh, uh, to react accordingly. Yes. Can you define larger bits and stuff like that in C? So there. Um, if we look at c++.com and look at the C integer types, there, this is, so the, this, the C library provides these types uh, that specify a, a specific width of integer rather than you know a, a long could be four or eight bytes depending on the system. Uh, but there is no um, there is not a built-in type that is more than, than 64 uh, bytes for an integer. So you could implement your own. You could implement 
uh, uh, say, uh, a struct that had some, uh, maybe a, a, a array, of, array of bytes, and then had a bunch of functions to turn this array of bytes into uh, specific integer values, but you'd also need uh, functions to do arithmetic with these two large values because you can't uh, uh, fit them in, in standard types. So uh, I don't actually know about C off the top of my head. I know that um, Python, for example, has a, a module to provide a sort of uh, a type of, uh, of number representation that's much slower, but can be kind of can, can accommodate a value of any size, kind of by doing all this extra work. Um, uh, but yeah, the, it's it takes extra work to to be able to accomplish that. Yes. Um, this is. I was wondering if you've ever seen either a legitimate program or just someone who's like, "Ha ha, I made this funny thing that constructively uses a um, interesting question. Uh, so in the next lab, uh, you will be um, solving kind of uh, uh, bit puzzles, and you will need to uh, at least account for and in some ways use the properties of, of overflow. Um, I, I mean, I know that that uh, uh, video game speedrunners often use integer overflow to like cause glitches to to cheese uh, 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 past um, walls or or, or uh, obstacles or or whatnot. But no, I I. I can't think of why uh, you'd want kind of, I mean, overflow in a sense is, is modular arithmetic, which kind of comes up in, in a lot of contexts, but um, yeah, it's not, it's more of a limitation than a kind of than a tool. <laughs> yes? Is, is there like a reason why languages that are okay with overflow or like don't have an exception wouldn't want to raise like at least a warning in compilation time or something? Or? So it, it can't do it in compile time. Because the calculation has to happen after. But like, you know, in demo mode, maybe. Um, yeah, so this is just, a, there's always a trade-off to make the language simpler and faster versus make the language uh, safer and more robust. And so Java and C said, we're not going to put an additional check on every arithmetic operation in order to detect overflow. So there is a benefit, but also a cost. So it, it's simply it's simply a trade-off, and um, yeah, when when you go for sort of the the speed and efficiency, it often puts more burden on the programmer to worry about these sorts of edge cases. Small follow-up. I know you mentioned Rust is kind of like a, a a version of C that kind of accounts better for programmer failure. What does Rust do with regard to? I don't know what Rust does for overflow off the top of my head. It's mainly about the memory side of things, about um, null pointers and uh, forgetting to free memory. It's just the compiler is extremely strict about that, and so there's a lot of mistakes you can make in C that you can't make in Rust. That your code just won't compile. But that's interesting. I should I should check what Rust does for for overflow. Um, so. I think that the other thing that I want to uh, go through in our remaining time is just some examples of arithmetic in two's complement. So if we wanted to do four plus negative three, and let's see, we were using four bit Four bit two's complement. We could get four zero one zero zero. 
we get negative 3 by, okay, we have a 1 for a negative 8. And again, from negative 8 to negative 3, we have to add 5. So then I put the, the bits for 5. And then by draw these out like this and just add the bits together, I get 1, 0, 0, carry the 1. 0, carry the 1. And so like I mentioned before, when we have some bit carry out of our fixed width arithmetic, if we only have 4 bits, we only keep 4 bits. And we throw away whatever uh, carried out. So the result, 0, 0, 0, 1, or 1. And that's what we want when we do 4 plus negative 3. So, Two's complement arithmetic works in part because when something carries out, we throw it away, and we're kind of using this, this modular nature, the way that it kind of continues uh, in this circle to, to make uh, arithmetic work. That sort of anything besides just adding up the base. Yeah? Well, that's not negative. Two. This would be negative 15 if we had five bits to store it. Oh, okay. But we only have four bits to store it, so we only keep the first four bits of the nice. result. Oh, it's on me. Oh, yeah. Other questions? All right, one uh, overflow example. We have six plus three. We have 0, 1, 1, 0 for 6, plus 0, 0, 1, 1 for 3. And again, stack those for easy arithmetic. 1, 0, carry the 1, 0, carry the 1, 1. So here we added 6 and 3 together. We didn't get any, uh, any bits carrying out. but in our 4-bit 2's complement, what does 1001 0, 0, 1 give us? Yeah, negative 7. A negative 8 plus 1. And so 6 plus 3 you know, would be 9, but with 4 bits we get uh, negative 7, uh, rather negative 8 to 7. So we can't actually make 9 in 4 bits 2's complement, and so it goes up to 7, and then keeps going into negative 8, and then negative 7. So we're going to add two positive numbers and get a negative result. That's one way that we know that overflow occurs. If both inputs were positive, but the output is negative, uh, it, must, it must have overflowed. Yes? Can we can just read it as unsigned. Can we just do that? There's no negative numbers, so there's no real need to read it as a sign So that's a good point that uh, if we're adding 6 and 3 in 4 bit unsigned numbers, we could make 9, and that's fine. But the way that we handle data in computing in general and, and in C is that. We have some bits stored in memory, and we have assigned a type, a way of interpreting those bits. And it's important that we kind of always interpret those, we interpret those bits consistently, that that interpretation doesn't just sort of change uh, arbitrarily. So because we said these were signed integers, we interpret the result as a signed integer. And so we could explicitly convert the result to an unsigned, um, but, but that's sort of a separate issue. All right, uh, that'll do it for today. Keep working on lab zero. There's some more practice uh, problems given in the notes. Hope you have a great weekend, and I'll see you on Monday. Thank you. Thank you.